Hello, this is Fred Haight. Some of you may have listened to a uh, guided tour of the Grossa Fuga, which is posted at this website. This is a follow-up tour. I call it Beethoven's Ode to Joy, the Grossa Fuga Inverted. By inverted, I don't refer to inversion of the intervals. I refer to inverting the entire process of double fugal development so that we sometimes come up with a mirror image, quite different than what we would have in the Grossa Fuga. I can hear objections already of people saying, well, gosh, I don't see any similarity between the Ode to Joy and the Grossa Fuga. After all, the Grossa Fuga has the, its arcane, its obtuse, it has this first subject theme, which is almost impossible to sing, even harder to remember, uh, not very pretty, and certainly will never be used as a song outside of the Grossa Fuga, whereas the Ode to Joy uh, features one of the most beloved melodies of all time, the Ode to Joy. It's, it's a hymn, it's in every hymn book in the world, it's an anthem, it's the uh, anthem of the European Union. Uh, it's been in countless movies and television commercials. It's in every beginner book on how to play your instrument, no matter what instrument you might pick, it's in there. It's on your cell phone ringtone list, so it, it's easy to sing, it's easy to remember. So how could you compare the Grossa Fuga to the Ode to Troy? They seem to be so opposite. Well, this is where this mere image question comes in. In preparation for this, I went back and reread an article that had moved me very deeply when it was first written in 1977. It was an article by Lyndon LaRouche called The Secret of Ludwig van Beethoven. I found one quote in that article which I had forgotten entirely. Quote, in fact, the last movement of the ninth is properly viewed from the standpoint otherwise established by the Grossa Fuga. Although the last movement of the ninth is not the Grossa Fuga, it should be performed as if it were the Grossa Fuga for orchestra and voice. Well, that was a pleasant surprise, but uh, here I was, i have been thinking it was my idea. And uh, upon rereading this, I remembered that, uh, in fact, I first got the idea from Lyndon LaRouche. I thought what he said was fascinating. Uh, I decided to investigate it, and as I so often do, found out that what he said was true. But over the intervening 36 years, during which I continued to work on it, I uh, forgot the, the debt that I owed for the inspiration in the first place. Here's another interesting quote from that article by LaRouche. The difficulty of the performances of the chorale movement of the Ninth Symphony begins with the fact that the orchestral aspect of performances, even under superior conductors, is by itself more or less satisfactorily real Beethoven. But even with qualified voices, the vocal parts are not. To make the point by stressing the worst case, one has the impression that the soloists and chorus are performing an anthem while the orchestra is governed by a different generative principle, the orchestra being relatively correct in this aspect of the matter. Continues, one's impulse must be to grab the chorus director by the shoulders and shake him, saying, this friend chorus director is absolutely not some kooky notion of an anthem, which you must plow through respectfully because of Beethoven's titular authority. It is not an anthem with orchestral accompaniment. Your voices are integral parts in what is perhaps one of the most tightly composed and most driving pieces of contrapuntal development in all music. One might continue bringing in the conductor to settle the matter. I demand, for Beethoven's sake, the excitement of his counterpoint. I demand surprise, contrapuntal ironies. Look at the voices as instruments, like the voices of the orchestra, and develop the contrapuntal tension of the enunciation, intonation, to the point that the last drop of romanticist sentimentality is expunged from the performance. Nor are the This is Promethean music, in which constant discovery is piling upon new discovery, constantly transforming the comprehension of what has already been heard. I don't object to the use of the Ode to Joy as a hymn or something else, although I don't think it belongs in Die Hard movies. Uh, it's beautiful and it makes people happy just to sing it. There's a reason for that. 
that is not obvious, and I'll come back to that later. But if you only listen to the anthem or the hymn, you're only getting one-tenth of one percent of what this piece is all about. Let us look at the genesis of the Ode to Joy. Beethoven first was inspired with the idea of setting Schiller's poem on die Freude, or Ode to Joy, in 1792, when he was only 22 years old. He completed the Ninth Symphony in 1824, about 32 years later. Was he working on it all that time? Well, no, but it was a long-term project for him. His work on it comes up over the years. There is a line in the Ode to Joy, Wer ein holdes Weib errungen, he who has won and held a noble wife, that line is in the Ninth Symphony, but it also forms a chorus in his opera Fidelio. As a practice piece for the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven wrote the choral fantasy to give himself the exercise that he needed to approach such a task. Beethoven once remarked that if a composer is to set a poem to music, he must rise far above the poet. That is easy in the case of Goethe, he said, but who can do that in the case of Schiller? What was it about this poem that so inspired Beethoven? When the Berlin Wall fell and communism began to collapse, Leonard Bernstein performed a concert for freedom in front of the wall, and he chose the Ninth Symphony as really the only adequate piece to celebrate this, and indeed it is. However, Bernstein said that Schiller, when he originally composed the poem, used the word Freiheit or freedom, and that under political pressure he was forced to reduce the power of the poem by substituting the word Freude or joy instead. If we comprehend Schiller's and Beethoven's concept of Freude or joy, we will see that it is in no way an inferior concept to Freiheit, and in fact it's a wonderful pun between Freude and Freiheit. Besides that, I don't really wish to share Mr. Bernstein's concept of freedom, and certainly not joy. We're going to look at the first few lines of the poem, and you'll just have to excuse my terrible German. It begins, Freude, schöner Güterfunken, joy the most beautiful of God's sparks. Güterfunken is a term coined by a man named Georg Forster. He was an associate of Ben Franklin and Republican circles in Europe, and God Sparks, Güterfunken, was a pun. It refers both to the electricity that Franklin was investigating, the electricity that could light up all of mankind, carry it forward, but it also was a pun referring to the divine spark of creativity of the type of scientific genius that could discover electricity. Schiller appropriated Forster's newly minted word and decided that joy was the most beautiful of God's sparks. So what type of joy are we talking about? Are we talking the joy of a newborn baby? Well, that might be included. Are we talking about the joy of winning the lottery? Less likely. Are we talking about the joy that one finds in sordid forms of entertainment? I think not at all. There is, however, a form of joy that comes with scientific discovery, which is synonymous with agape, or love, the highest form of divine love. That love is the love of the Creator, but it is also the love of mankind as made in the image of the Creator. How are we made in the image of the Creator? What differentiates us from the animals? Among all of God's creations, only one, mankind, participates in the ongoing creation and makes creative discoveries that change the world, that change history. There is a type of joy that comes from that that is unmatched by any lower form of pleasure. As for freedom, if you read Friedrich Schiller's Aesthetic Letters on the Education of Mankind, he is quite convinced that the only way we're ever going to achieve political freedom is precisely through fostering, nurturing, and developing precisely those cognitive capabilities for creative discovery among the population. And how does he see doing that? 
He sees it not only through art, but revolutionary improvements in works of art, which is what he's doing and certainly what Beethoven is doing with the Ninth Symphony. In that sense, joy and freedom do not seem so far apart. That's a long analysis for the first line of a poem. I promise to proceed a little more quickly. Freude schöne Güterfunken, Tochter aus Elysium, daughter of Elysium. Elysium was the place where the Greeks thought that the noble and the brave uh, went to live in the afterlife. Wir betreten Feuer trunken. We will be coming to you drunk with fire. There's two great words, Gütterfunken and Feuer trunken. Drunk with fire, what are we drunk on? We're drunk on the fire, the sparks, the divine spark, the Gütterfunken. So it's not really drunk in that sense. Himmlische dein Heiligtum. Holy one to thy temple. Deinet sauber, bin den wieder, Wasch die Mode streng geteilt. Your magic will bind together what stern custom has separated, put asunder. All a mention werden Bruter. All mankind shall become as brothers. Wo dein sanfter Flügel weilt, under the soft flight of thy wings. This coming universal brotherhood of mankind was something that Schiller and Beethoven deeply believed in. The, the, it was one of the most optimistic periods in history, and there was every reason to believe it. I'll come back to that later. No wonder Beethoven was intimidated by the prospect of trying to rise above Schiller. How do you do it? The complexity of the meaning of the poem would seem to require a very complex setting, and yet the very nature of it also seems to require a simple setting. I don't know if Beethoven ever tried to set it as a song for voice and piano, as most leader are set. I would not be surprised to find that Beethoven decided that nothing less than an orchestra, chorus, and soloist would be adequate for a song setting of this poem. As for choosing between a complex setting and a simple setting, Beethoven accomplished both in a magnificent manner way beyond anything ever done before. In 1822, Beethoven received a commission to write a symphony. In 1824, he finished the Ninth Symphony. Lest anyone think that the Ode to Joy is so simple that it simply popped into his head, finished, let's examine his sketchbooks from the year 1823. Beethoven's sketchbooks are an invaluable guide to his creative process, and he made many sketches for the Ninth Symphony. Here is one sketch for the words Freude schöne Güterfunken, Pachter aus Elysium. And I'm kind of glad he didn't stick with that. And here is a sketch for the entire song. You may notice that the middle part, Deinet Zauber binden wieder, is very undeveloped compared to the finished version. the Dinah Zauber section there to the finished product and there's a lot more twists and turns in it in the finished version aren't there so here's a paradox maybe the Oh, to joy theme is not as simple as we thought, yet paradoxically it still is eminently singable. This brings me back to a point that I made earlier of why the Ode to Joy theme, merely presented as a hymn song whatever, is so moving. It reflects a process of creative work and discovery far beyond anything that you could ever find just by looking at the tune itself. And what is that creative process exactly? Did Beethoven say, well, I got to write the song first and then I can write the rest of the symphony? 
Even more unlikely, did he have the symphony finished and just couldn't quite get the song down? No, they co-evolved. There is a reciprocity in the creative process between the microcosm and macrocosm. Each discovery in one changes the boundary conditions of the other. It's not linear, it would be very hard to trace out, but it's there. And that brings me to my first point of observation in why I call the Ode to Joy the Grossa Fuga inverted. Whereas the first subject of the double fugue in the Grossa Fuga might seem very arcane, obtuse, and only for the cognizenti and connoisseurs, certainly never going to become popular, certainly never going to be used in any other song. The um, first subject of the double fugue in the Ninth Symphony, which derives from the Ode to Joy theme, is, again, comes from one of the most popular, lo beloved songs in all of history. They seem opposite in many ways, but I hope I'm getting at something here in which we see the double fugal process behind both of them. Now, you might argue that because the uh, uh, Ninth Symphony is so much more accessible uh, and so much more popular, the Japanese average 55 performance of the Ninth Symphony every New Year's. How long would it take to get 55 performances of the Grossa Fuga? Thus, you might argue that because the Ninth Symphony is far more accessible and popular, that it's a better piece than the Grossa Fuga. Well, I have to answer that with number one, popular does not mean better, though there is something to be said for not reaching down to the masses and catering them at their own level, meeting them where they're at, as people sometimes say, but designing something so great as this, yet still has that capability for outreach to so many people. As well, the Grossa Fuga is written a couple of years later and is a much more uh, rigorously developed piece. Beethoven has increased his compositional powers over the time. And secondly, when you look at the entire fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, it is not, it's very, very complex. It's double fugal after all. And in fact, there have been many uh, prominent artists and critics throughout history who didn't find it very popular with themselves at all. Listen to what Leo Tolstoy, famous author of War and Peace, had to, I had to say about it in his article, What is Art? Quote, not only do I not see how the feelings transmitted by this work could unite people not specially trained to submit themselves to its complex hypnotism, but I am unable to imagine to myself a crowd of normal people who could understand anything of this long, confused, and artificial production except short snatches which are lost in a sea of what is incomprehensible. And therefore, whether I like it or not, I am compelled to conclude that this work belongs to the rank of bad art. That's Leo Tolstoy from his What is Art? And even today we get people who object violently. Uh, feminist music historian Susan McClary said of the uh, first movement of the ninth, quote, the point of rec recapitulation in the first movement of the ninth is one of the most horrifying moments in music, as the carefully prepared cadence is frustrated, damming up energy which finally explodes in the throttling, murderous rage of a rapist. Okay, what is it that has gotten this, these people's shirts into such a knot? Let's listen to a bit. But first I'll say that with most compositions, the composer presents the finished work, uh, and it's your job, if you wish to understand what his creative discovery was, is to study the work in order to try to ascertain what his creative breakthrough actually was. And Beethoven, in his late works, begins several works with an introduction which is of an improvisatory nature. That introductions, those introductions are both designed to establish the musical geometry or space within which he will be working, such as the introduction to the Opus 111 Piano Sonata, but some of them are also designed to share with you 
the process of a creative discovery, to take the actual creative discovery and put that into music, which is something that no one had really done before. It's a, it's a great pedagogical tool and it's something that he is sharing uh, with his audiences. Uh, there's no place that I know of where he shares that d the process of creative discovery with you as much as the introduction to the fourth movement of the ninth symphony. So let us listen to that introduction to the uh, fourth movement of the ninth symphony and as we go along I will make a comparison of that with another such introduction which is the introduction to the Grosse Fuga which serves a similar purpose but works very very differently. Here is the introduction to the fourth movement of the ninth symphony as played by Willem Furtwängler and the Berlin Philharmonic in 1954 and all further excerpts in this uh, presentation will come from that same recording except one which I will identify. As you listen, think about not ordinary everyday problem solving, but the type that requires you to generate some completely new knowledge. Well, if that was clear to you, then you've probably looked at it before. Let's go through it bit by bit. After that opening very pronounced dissonance, the cellos and double basses play a single line of music. If it sounded to you like those uh, cellos and double basses were talking to you, it's because they were. In the score, underneath that part, Beethoven wrote the words in French, Selon le caractère 
the recitative may in temple, which means according to the character of a recitative, but in temple. In opera, an aria is the beautiful solo sung by the singers. Recitative is somewhere between singing and acting. They still use notes, but it's not particularly melodic, and they cover a lot of word. But here is a short recitative from a Mozart opera, just to give you the idea. In the score, Beethoven does not have words underneath the recitative section, or rather recitative-like sections, except for that indication that I just cited. However, in the uh, sketchbook, he does. And under that short recitative, which I just repeated for you, which comes after that opening dissonance, he wrote the words, No, this would remind us too much of our despair. Let us continue on with the next section of this introduction. See if you can recognize what happens next. The segment did, I just played opened with a quote from the first movement of the Ninth Symphony, followed by another one of these recitatives, and now he's going to quote the second movement and follow it with the recitative. <laughs> Under that last recitative in the sketchbook, Beethoven wrote the words, Oh no, not this. Something else pleasing is what I asked. And can't you just hear the words, Oh no, or Oh nein in German on those first two notes? Next, Beethoven quotes the third movement of this same Ninth Symphony and follows that by a recitative. Under this last section of recitative, he writes the word, nor this, it is too tender, tender, for something animated must we seek. In the overture, the overture to the Gross of Fuga, Beethoven took four radically different transformations of the first fugue subject, posed them against each other through just juxtaposition without development, but in the backwards order to which they occurred in the piece posing a question for you of the generative process that could allow such transformations to take place. Here he has posed uh, two very strong dissonances uh, and the openings of the first three movements of the symphony in the order in which they occur in the symphony. So again, the introductions to both the Grosse Fuga and the fourth movement of the ninth serve a similar kind of pedagogical purpose, but they are very, very different. And the 
Certainly the introduction of the Grosse Fuge is much more compact. What's he doing in this introduction to the fourth movement of the ninth? Wagner said that he was rejecting his previous movements, that he was in fact rejecting instrumental music altogether. Beethoven had to bring the voice in, and from now on, everything would be music drama with orchestra and voice. What nonsense. Beethoven was not rejecting anything. I once had the opportunity to ask Lyndon LaRouche a question about the double fugal nature of the last movement in this piece, and he responded, he said, well, Fred, what you've struck on is that uh, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony backwards, and that's true for reasons that we will see later. But that means that the first three movements are all part of the process of leading us towards this discovery. They're not something that he suddenly decided was inadequate and had to abandon. You have to remember that the order in which the composer presents the music is pedagogically designed for the listener. It's not necessarily the order in which he made the discoveries. But the introduction is not over. In fact, we are coming up to the main point. Beethoven has been examining the first three movements of his uh, symphony. The recitatives in the bases uh, address the inadequacy of each of these movements, as beautiful as they are, to address what's necessary. He has to create something new, and that's what he's sharing with you in this introduction. Something new in order to set Schiller to music, in order to capture the notion of joy that Schiller meant. That something new will require the introduction of voices into a symphony, which is something new, it's never been done before. It requires an entirely new form. The fourth movement of the ninth does not follow any previously existing uh, symphonic form. And it requires a development of the Bach double fugue into a whole new double fugal method as applied to Schiller's poem, and we will get to that later. So. The next section of the introduction features first just a little hint of the Freud theme, as though it's, aha, it's beginning to come into my mind, I'm beginning to get it. And the recitatives that go with it say, I shall see to it that I myself intone something, then you do sing after me. Ha! This is it. It is now discovered. Freud. Well, I think that's pretty clear. Let's listen to it. Okay, that was quite an introduction over three minutes long, and it, certainly it's the audience. Put yourself in the shoes of the f audience seeing this for the first time. It's, the music's been going for three quarters of an hour. You see a chorus sitting up there, you know they're going to sing. You see soloists, you know they're going to sing, and it's a symphony for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know that he's setting a Schiller poem to music. You have pretty high expectations here. So after this, after that cadence, he is going to play his theme. <clears throat> and just as when I looked at the first fugue subject in the Grosse Fuga, when it's stated all by itself in just one instrument at the end of the Overtura, and just as I said then, well, you're going to say, my God, that's it? That's the theme? I listen to this as it's played just in one voice by the cellos and double basses, which are, of course, the instruments that have been carrying on the recitative like uh, dialogue on the creative discovery necessary and announced in the last recitative like section that they had made the discovery. Aha! This is it. And they are very low instruments and they play it somewhat and somewhat tentatively at that. And then again, think of the audience. Remember, they haven't heard this. They don't know what's famous. They're not just going to start humming along with it. Would you, if you were in that original audience, say, Oh yes, this is what I've been waiting for. 
This is it. Although there is an element of play involved, Beethoven's audience would know the poem and would be able to tell that the melody they're listening to matched the words so familiar to them. However, Beethoven then repeats it uh, and adds an extra voice in the strings. The violas and cellos are playing the melody, the contrabasses have a different part, and uh, the bassoon is playing something quite contrapuntally at odds with it. It at least forces the audience to reconsider what might have at first been their initial skepticism. But perhaps Beethoven is once again replicating the creative process for his audience. Uh, in his own mind, the idea emerged slowly and gradually into something full-blown and exciting, and perhaps through these repetitions, he's allowing the audience to experience the same growth uh, of the idea from something tentative to something joyous, as we'll see in the later variations. Then Beethoven repeats it again, this time in four voices. The contrabasses have a part, violas and cellos still playing the same thing, uh, but the uh, first and second violins have different parts and the bassoon is still in there. And with this, Beethoven proves the beauty of his piece beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now Beethoven repeats it for a fourth time, and this time totally triumphant with full orchestra. Perhaps you can see now why I have the image that he has presented his new theme, his new idea, in a very simple form at first, so that one would really wonder if this was going to be the revolution that you were counting on, but also to let the idea slowly emerge in the mind, as it does, in fact, in the creative process. And it's only finally at this point that there's not the slightest doubt about it.
Next, this triumph just begins to soar in exuberance. But then suddenly the whole process is ripped off by beginning by returning to the very opening beginning dissonance of the movement. Why? Well, maybe why he returns to that opening dissonance of the movement is because we still got a chorus and solo was sitting there. Uh, and they got to sing. They got to be brought in. This time, rather than the recitative being carried by the cellos and contrabasses, it is sung by a baritone with word. And whereas all the rest of the text in the fourth movement is from Schiller's poem, these words are written by Beethoven himself, and they are translated as, O oh, friends, no more of these sounds. Let us sing more cheerful songs, more full of joy. Now, before we continue, I must introduce an important point. Way back around the time of that article by Lyndon LaRouche, The Secret of Ludwig van Beethoven, he insisted that the last part of that baritone solo on the word Freudenfollera, more full of joy, was in fact the stretto of the uh, piece, of the movement. Uh, the fellow who, his, who was his leading music collaborator at the time objected strongly and said, well, then you don't really know what a stretto is, and uh, tried to demonstrate stretto in Bach, in uh, Chopin, and he was pointing out the formal aspects of stretto, and they're very different in Bach and Chopin, whereas what Mr. LaRouche was getting at is that it's the part that uh, kind of captures the actual creative breakthrough in the uh, piece. The creative breakthrough, of course, is in the mind, not in the piece itself, but there are parts in the piece that access it as a creative moment. That's what he was looking for when he was studying the score. He wasn't looking for the formalities everybody else looked for, but as a creative thinker himself, he was looking for where are the creative breakthroughs. So uh, just to demonstrate, I found out later for myself that he was right, and I'll demonstrate it to you right now. I'm going to play for you that last bit of the baritone uh, recitative on the word Freudenfollera. I'm going to play where we heard exactly the same notes in uh, an earlier recitative played by the cellos.
though Beethoven did not write any words in the score under that recitative section for cellos and double bass, in the sketches he did write the words, Ha! This is it! It is now discovered! Freude! So I think we could safely say that that did fulfill the stretto function for the piano. In the instrumental part, that section was followed by a strong cadence on two notes, which then was followed by a silence, and after that we heard the Ode to Joy theme stated somewhat tentatively by the cellos and double bass. However, after the baritone recitative, which pretty much sings the same notes as what the cellos and double basses did, uh, there's a very important thing that happens. We only hear the first note of the cadence, and between that and the entering of the uh, Ode to Joy theme, which this time there's nothing tentative about it, there's a short exchange between the woodwinds, the baritone, and the bass bass voices of the chorus on the word Freude. This begins the uh, complete, one of the two complete vocal statements of the Ode to Joy on the text of the first verse. So let's just listen to that. Before we go on, in the instrumental opening, right after the end of the introduction, Beethoven stated his Ode to Joy theme and then proceeded with uh, three different variations on it. He does the same here, although the variations are of a completely different nature. So let us proceed to the second variation, or rather first variation, since what we just heard was the theme, and sung by the soloist. This verse, this is the second verse of Schiller's poem, and this contains the words, Wer ein Holders Weib Arungen from the poem which were used in the opera Fidelio. Then another third variation, or rather second variation, on the third verse of Schiller's poem, but it ends uh, with a total surprise and the introduction of something revolutionary, which we will take a look at when we get there.
wow, that verse seemed to be proceeding, repeating the same as the others, and it seemed to end, and then what happened? This would be the right place to look at threads that run throughout the symphony as a whole, but I'm afraid that it would make the uh, tour too long, and probably take a good hour, and I'm afraid it also might be difficult to hear. Uh, so I'm just, you're just going to have to trust me. This is one of the most integrated pieces of music in history, and it runs right from the first note of the first movement right through to the last note of the fourth movement. But maybe I will try one short comparison that I think is easier to hear, and by which we can at least hear that dramatic change on the last words Ford got foreshadowed earlier in the symphony. This is from the third movement, and pay special attention to the last two notes of each of these excerpts. And this is what we just heard from the fourth movement. Now Beethoven introduces something new unexpected, revolutionary. It's called the Turkish March. It seems to come as if out of nowhere. Let's just listen to a bit of that. Unexpected. this so totally new? I'm going to go back and play the beginning again, and I'm going to play the Ode to Joy theme against, unfortunately, on a guitar, but you'll hear it. <laughs> is like the kind of transformations of a theme that we saw in the Grossa Fuga. However, he also managed to combine the Ode to Joy theme, transformed very much, but still the Ode to Joy theme, with the characteristic rhythm of the first movement. <laughs> Compare that quote from the first movement to... So we have the same rhythm from two things that are as different as they could possibly be, and creating a unity in our minds for a piece that's going on for over an hour. However, I talked about comparing this to the Grossa Fuga in terms of the double fugal method. Have you heard a double fugue yet? Have you heard a fugue yet? Beethoven ends this section with the orchestra. <laughs> Well, 
What is this, just busy work? Well, no, if you look at it closely, it's actually a double fugue. But is it based on anything? Well, let's look at one subject. I'm going to play it a little bit slowly. That's in the cellos, faster than that. But doesn't that remind you of something? It's a sped up version, slightly changed, of the Freude theme. What's the other fugue subject? Isn't that a changed version of? The main theme of this Turkish march, which in itself, as you remember when I played my guitar against it, we heard was itself a transformation of the Freude theme. So we now have a double fugue uh, with the Freud theme in a dialogue with itself, in a, in a dialogue with the changes that have occurred in itself, in a fugue with itself in two very different transformed forms. That's amazing. But is that still what we're looking for in terms of the double fugal method? It is a double fugue and it's worthy of the Grosse Fuga and the type of uh, transformations that we have seen are of that order. But since the end of the introduction, everything that we have heard has been a transformation of the Freude theme, the Ode to Joy theme. Miraculous transformations, but don't we need a completely different second subject? This double fugue continues until it comes to a halt on a single tone, octaves of F sharp, and then has to make up its mind where it's going to go. If you don't believe me, just listen. Most of my listeners have probably heard it and know where it's going to go, but again, put yourself in the shoes of the people hearing it for the first time. They've been through a lot of transformations, and it's a long time since they've heard the original Ode to Joy theme with the original first verse and uh, stated as an entire song. And now they're going to hear it again, but my, they're going to hear it in its full glory. The entire chorus is singing its forte, the entire orchestra is in there, including the brass, the timpani air pounding away, and interestingly, it's in the same 6-8 time as the preceding double fugue, coming straight out of it in a way.
magnificent. Now, however, Beethoven does something shocking. He just rips this off and suddenly launches into something completely new, something which is uh, recitative-like. It reminds us a little bit of the earlier recitatives. And it also reminds me of the shocking way in which in the much later piece, The Gross of Fuga, he rudely interrupts several section sections, just brings them to a screeching halt. <laughs> is not another variation on the Freude theme, the Ode to Joy theme. This is something new. To get a handle on it, let us go back and look at Schiller's poem once again. If you look at his poem, you'll see that each verse has a total of 12 lines. The final four lines have in front of it the word Chor, C-H-O-R, which means chorus in German. So you have eight lines and then four lines that say core or chorus. I don't know what Schiller's intent was on how the poem should be read, but I certainly get a sense of an entire chorus, the entire world of voices joining in to affirm and sing this song of joy, of agape, of love of mankind. What are the words here in this chorus section of the first verse? Seid umschlungen, Millionen. Be embraced, O ye millions. Today it would have to be billions. Diesen Kuss der, ganz, der ganzen Welt. This kiss for all the world. Bruder, uben im Sternenzelt. Brothers, above the field of stars, muss ein lieber Vater wohnen must a loving father dwell. Let's listen to just a bit of that. <laughs> unusual. The voices sing much of the time in unison, all the voices together on the same notes. If it does break into four-part harmony, it comes right back to unison uh, once more. It does not seem to be very melodic, certainly not in the sense of the Ode to Joy. It, has, it seems to have some of the character of a recitative, except recitatives usually get a lot of words over in a hurry. And this is the opposite. Here, each syllable is sung slowly and deliberatively. As I looked at it and thought about it, though, the, the idea of a Greek chorus, the chorus from a Greek drama, kept occurring to me, though I couldn't quite figure out why. But also, Lyndon LaRouche in the aforementioned article had also mentioned Greek uh, tragedy. And... In a Greek tragedy, the chorus 
uh, the action on the stage stops sometimes and the chorus walks slowly, dances actually slowly across the stage, first all in one direction and then the other direction, and they're talking or singing and every member of the chorus is saying uh, exactly the same thing. And I wondered, well, Schiller marks this chorus, why would Beethoven have the entire chorus singing in unison, except that's what a Greek chorus does. But then finally I remembered that Schiller wrote a essay called on the uh, <clears throat> on the use of uh, the chorus in Greek tragedy. I'm not sure if that, I don't recall if that's exactly the name. But he had something very interesting to say, which is that in Greek tragedy, the chorus comes in to locate things in the universal standpoint. Specifically, Schiller said that when we get caught up too emotionally in the action of the individuals on the stage, the chorus would come in to allow us to step back from that and situate the passionate circumstances going on in the stage in a larger historical, more universal context. And certainly the words to his chorus sections of the poem, uh, be embraced, O ye millions, do you feel him near, ye millions, uh, certainly has that characteristic. So. I'm thinking that in Schiller's poem, when he writes chorus, he doesn't mean, a, he means a chorus in the sense of the chorus in Greek tragedy. And in that sense, the meaning of the word chorus is different. It doesn't mean a chorus as we know today, as Beethoven employs in the symphony. <clears throat> but the word chorus in Greek comes from the Greek word for to dance. And the word feet in poetry comes from where their feet landed as they were reciting the poetry as they walked across the stage. So for the Greek chorus, dancing, poetry, music, and drama uh, were all combined into one thing. And thus Beethoven does not differentiate, he does not pose the two different sections of each verse of Schiller by soloists and a chorus in terms of the modern musical sense of a chorus. It's a different idea than that. And I'm thinking that Beethoven's uh, musical setting of, or rather those sections of Schiller's verse that were marked for chorus, that indicates that he understood that. Shortly after, Beethoven sets the core section, that four-line choral section, from the second verse of Schiller's poem, rather the third verse. And these words go, Hier stürzt nieder, millionen, do ye, do ye fall down, O ye millions, as to fall down on your knees before the Creator. Honest do den Schipfer doubt? Do you feel your creator near world? Zukin uben Sternen sent. Look for him above the field of stars. Sternenzelt is sometimes translated as field of stars, sometimes even worse as tent of stars. I, I think probably canopy of stars would be a better translation because I think it refers to the, uh, the, the ancients had the conception of a celestial sphere, of the stars being placed on a celestial sphere, which was about as far as you could go. And Schiller is referring to the Creator as lying beyond that celestial sphere. And I think, therefore, canopy of stars might be a better translation. Uber Sternen mus er bonen. Above the stars he must live. If the German speakers among my listeners can resist throwing tomatoes at their laptops, then let's listen to that.
if anything could make you feel the sense of the creator lying above the stars, that can. What incredible tension he has built up. Before we proceed, and we are rapidly proceeding to the main point, the center of this movement, let us review and look back and see how Beethoven has treated Schiller's poem. The Turkish march was an exception. It came from later on in the poem, but otherwise Beethoven has stuck to the ordering of the poem in a particular way. The Ode to Joy theme and it, the two variations on it were based on the first eight lines of each of the first three verses of the poem. Now this section is based on the last four lines, the, the lines marked chorus, of the first two verses of the poem, or rather the first and third verses of the poem, but still the chorus sections, on a different theme, a different, if you can call it a theme, a different musical idea. What is he doing here? Beethoven continues by, once again, with just the line, Uber Sternen muss erfonen, above the stars he must live. But he does it on incredible tension, harmonic tension, rhythmic tension, so that you can hardly bear it. Yet at the same time, there is a sense of impending breakthrough. You get a sense that something magnificent is about to happen. You get a sense that there is a tremendous discovery about to take place. It may be the type of discovery that you would never imagine, but when you hear it, you will recognize it and say, aha, well, of course that was the idea. But you're going to have to wait for a minute. Let me play just that part before the breakthrough. This is followed by the heart and soul of the Ode to Joy, of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony. By the very center and the core of it, the discovery which, from which Beethoven worked backwards to compose the rest of the symphony in order to lead up to this. It may surprise many that I do not regard the setting of the Ode to Joy theme as beautiful and as wonderful and as well known as it is as the heart and soul, the central breakthrough is a breakthrough to discover that in the first place, but you'll find it in a moment why this is. See if you can tell what you are listening to before I explain it to you. This is a double fugue. Let me trace it out for you. The sopranos enter with the following. What you can clearly hear is based on the Freude theme. Only it's in 6-4. And just those first six notes Keep repeating as a theme. And the sopranos are singing the words Freude Schöner Gutufunk, in the beginning part of the first verse of Schiller's poem, which had been set to the Ode to Joy theme from which this fugue subject is derived. The altos come in just before the sopranos with this. And they're singing, Seid um schlungen Millionen, diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt, the first line of the last part of the first verse of Schiller's poem, the first line of the part marked chorus. And we've heard those words set before, but surely that line that we just heard in the double, the double fugue doesn't come out of this. I 
will play exactly those same notes, but change them to the rhythm of the double fugue. And then all I have to do is bring, that's the same notes, uh, a different key, but the same notes. Then if I bring the middle section down an octave, same notes but an octave lower, it is exactly the same. You may recall that the fugue proper, the double fugue proper in the Grossa Fuga opened with the first fugue subject and the second fugue subject entering as a pair. So they began a development of a double fugue with a pair of subjects stated at the same time. This group opens the same way. The alto and soprano voices, one opens with the Freude theme as the first fugue subject and the other with the Zeid und Schlumen theme as the second fugue subject. The two enter as a pair and they are essentially the first voice in a double fugue. I'll play them together for you now. To remind you, the two fugue subjects in the Grotes of Fuga entered as a pair like this. Those of you who listened to my presentation on the Grosso Fuga might recall that at the beginning of it I played double fugues by Handel and Bach and showed one difference between them, whereas Handel started out uh, with the pair of fugue subjects stated at the same time, uh, Bach more frequently would develop one fugue subject and then bring in the other later. Uh, in his Art of the Fugue, his last work, he uh, what he often does, such as is in the uh, unfinished uh, quadruple fugue number 19, develop one fugue subject as a fugue, set it aside for a bit, develop a second fugue subject as a fugue, and then combine them into a double fugue and go on from there. Uh, the Grossa Fuga, in terms of a formal presentation anyhow, tends to follow the first of those two, uh, presenting the two fugue subjects at the same time, whereas this uh, at least formally tends to follow the Bach model more because you have Zeit, uh, Freude developed for a long time, then set aside Zeitung Schlungen developed for a long time, and then suddenly the surprise of them emerging as a double fugue together. I, I wouldn't make too literal a mapping of that. I don't think Beethoven is really in one place favoring the Handel style and another the, uh, the Bach approach. I think he's absorbed them both quite deeply and gone way beyond it. But that Again, that is one of these, uh, what I call the uh, inverted qualities of the double fugal process between the uh, Grossa Fuga and the Ninth Symphony. Again, the Grossa Fuga, after the overture, begins with the, the pair of fugue subjects stated immediately at the same time, whereas in the uh, Ninth Symphony, they develop separately, and we get a wonderful surprise when they combine into a double fugue towards the end of the piece, which is another way that perhaps the uh, Rosa Fuga and the fourth movement of the ninth may have a mere image sort of relation. I don't want to read too much into Schiller's poem and how Beethoven is looking at it, but I think I'm on safe ground saying that Schiller, throughout the first eight lines of every verse, is celebrating joy, freedom, creativity, love, agape, or agape, uh, <clears throat> which occurs in the individual. But at the end of each verse, in the four lines marked chorus, he has the entire world, the universe, come in to join and celebrate that for all humanity. And as I said before, very much fulfilling Schiller's idea of the function of the chorus in a Greek tragedy, although the principle does not need to be limited to tragedy. And it's the constant interplay between those eight lines and the section mount chorus, which is the play between the universality and the individual that Schiller has. And that play between the universal and the individual is necessary because that type of creative discovery, that type of love of a great gift to mankind, that takes place in the individual mind. 
like a Benjamin Franklin or like a Schiller or like a Beethoven. And in fact, if humanity is going to be uplifted, educated, and politically advanced, humanity depends upon exactly those types of individuals to do it. And there is a reciprocity involved. Society must nurture and encourage the development of that creative divine spark in each and every individual so that it may have the type of individuals that it depends upon to survive. Those individuals, on the other hand, only develop that kind, only take those types of creative abilities to their height by contributing to the advancement and furtherment of society as a whole. And so that interplay, interplay between the universal and the discrete is absolutely necessary. But whereas Schiller obtains it through the constant interplay between the eight line sections and the chorus sections, Beethoven does it through a great double fugue one theme based on the eight lines and another theme based on the chorus section of the verse. And that is something a poem cannot do. Remember the quote I said earlier when Beethoven said that in order to set a poem to music, the musician must lift himself above the poet? That's not an ego thing. That's because music as a language is capable of doing that and has to do that. Otherwise, the poem would suffice. And Beethoven succeeds in this way in taking Schiller further than Schiller could have gone with a verse. And I will submit to you that the form of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, which the best anybody can do to describe it is free fantasy form. They don't have anything else to describe it. But that form actually derives from Schiller's poem. And Beethoven seeing the double fugal implications of the poem, as his seeing the double fugue as the way to achieve in music that type of back and forth between individuality and all of humanity that Schiller expresses in the poem. Since this double fugue is the heart and core uh, and the creative breakthrough of the entire Ninth Symphony, I will play it for you in its entirety, but let it be preceded once again by that moment of tension. heard how that was punctuated with utterance of Freude, aided by the timpani, Freude, on the interval of the fifth, or its inversion, the fourth. Freude, that may remind you of the very opening of the vocal part, when you had that little quick dialogue between the baritone and the basses. Freude, 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 Freude. That interval of the fifth or fourth, and the ambiguity that it involves. The double fugue, it occurs a couple of times also on the notes E and A. Freude, 
Right in. Has been key throughout the symphony, right from the very opening. Kurt Wagner's entire performance is magnificent, and his performance of the double fugue is an integral part to the way he does it. And though I do believe his double fugue is the best, and his overall performance is uh, head and shoulders above anything else, I do think, though, sometimes that you can hear a little more in the double fugue when it's done slower. So just to uh, hear a little more in the double fugue, I'm going to play a slower version of it by Hans Schmidt. Is her step. I find that performance uh, a bit too rigid. Beethoven follows the fugue with the setting of the last four lines of the second verse, the one we discussed before that starts, Ihr, ihr stürzt nieder, and is roughly translated as, Do you fall on your knees before him, O ye millions? Do you feel the presence of your maker near? Brothers, look for him above the field of stars. Above the stars he must dwell, a loving Father above the stars, a loving father must dwell. Millionen. The last part of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony reminds me of the Grossa Fuga in a certain way. After the key breakthrough in the Grossa Fuga, where the two few subjects which clash so violently sing so beautifully together, the piece proceeds playfully and happily with very, many, many short segments just succeeding one another uh, to the end, which is a great success. The end of it. The same thing happens here. After this, we have a lot of short segments, which are very playful, and the whole ending of it has a victorious quality to it. 
But what's unique about it is that each segment is based on either the first fugue subject, or at least mostly, namely the Freude melody, the O to Joy theme, and the words associated with it, Freude, Schöner, Gutter, Funken, or the second fugue subject, the melody associated with Zeid um Schlumen Millionen, and with those words. You only have the first part of the first verse and the last four lines of the first verse. Those are the only words present from here to the end of the symphony, and they are all based on very rapid transformations of those two themes, which were the two fugue subjects for the double fugue. Only well, now they alternate with each other rapidly rather than combining into a double fugue. And at the very end, Zeidum Schlumen involves into Freude, evolves into Freude. So uh, I'm not going to trace out all those transformations for you. At this point, I think you can easily do that for yourself. I'm just going to let you enjoy from here to the end of the symphony. But I will add one last thought. If you did listen to the presentation on the Grosse Fuga, you may recall that Beethoven's inscription over the work was Tanto Libre, Tanto Recherche, sometimes free, sometimes rigorous. Uh, and my remark that this helped me understand why LaRouche referred to Beethoven's double fugal method rather than Beethoven's formal double fugues. And I discussed in the Grosse Fuga that even though there are sections of it that are very strict fugal writing and there are sections of it that are not fugal at all, the entire thing is part of one big double fugal process because it concerns throughout the development and transformation of a pair of ideas, both as individual ideas and as a pair. And likewise, as I said, the, very, the, the end, from now to the end of the piece, alternates between the Zeidum Schlumen theme uh, with those words and the Freude theme with those words, uh, which were the basis of the two fugue subjects in the double fugue. And though you won't hear any fugal writing from here to the end, the development of that pair, the constant interplay and change among that pair, uh, is the subject, and thus it is still double fugal in its intent, whether fugal is present or not. So, enjoy.
So that's the end of this guided tour. Once again, I count on my astute listeners to have heard many things that I didn't mention, probably heard many things that I missed, uh, to have all kinds of insights into other pieces and to uh, have their curiosity peaked. If you wish, Beethoven's fugal and double fugal writing is all over his late works, but if you wish to investigate two monumental w, double fugal pieces, besides the Rosa Fuga and the fourth movement of the ninth, then check out the fourth movement of his piano sonata, opus 106, the Hammerklavier, and check out the very ending of the credo from his Misa Solemnis. It's on the words, Ad vitem venturi seculi, the life of the world to come, which forms one fugue subject, and Amen, which forms the other fugue subject. And with that, I'll say Amen and good night, and thank you for listening.